Hi. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that was fun. <laughs> uh, this is episode three of QA Science. Uh, you are our third speaker, and that was amazing. I think we can all agree on that. That was an absolutely amazing talk. And I think the. I'm going, all don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, of course, uh, we here are in front of um, uh, honor students from UA Honors College as well as uh, teachers from our community. So we have a real mixed bag here. We're just going to, you've done this before. We're going to open this up. I want to start off by uh, kind of asking a question here that I couldn't help but think about over and over. Also, considering that I have children as well, and we talked about this, we, we both have kids. Um, I get this feeling that it's too late. I get this feeling it's too late. No and I way, think, man. Okay, thank you. Talk <laughs> me off this cliff because... We already dropped 15%. We're the, you know, we are the richest country in the world. We are the most technologically advanced. We've already dropped 15% while growing our economy. We've already proved it can happen. It can, we can bend this curve. We've bent the United States curve. Now we need to grow it. We need to get... We need to build more technology that lets us reduce our emissions. And that's everything from... LED bulbs to electric cars to uh, conservation at, at every level. My friend Kim Cobb is the Georgia Power Chair at Georgia Tech, and she runs a class where she actually does a challenge where all the students run, work in teams to actually figure out who can, what, what could we do that would pay for itself by, re, by reducing carbon emissions? What could we do? And the winners, Georgia Power, the company, sends them to D.C. to talk to their legislators. Wow. It's the coolest thing. And Georgia Tech benefits from this because every year it's cheaper to run the campus. Not a joke. So we're working on sustainability right yeah. here at the University of Arizona. And every city, every state should be doing the same thing because who wants to just waste money? Nobody. In this case, both prosperity and sustainability go together. We already know this works. Now it's just a matter of pushing harder because we can. Now, we haven't done anything organized, right? We don't have a carbon tax. We don't have, you know, the rebates that we do in our cities and say, hey, if you put in a, ch a better, more efficient HVAC, you know, we'll give you a rebate on this. You know, you'll get $1,000 off your taxes or you'll get a rebate from the energy company. And these are fantastic things that can really help people move to more efficient you know, lifestyles, and then they don't have to pay so much for their darn energy. I don't know about you, but before I got it, my new age back, I was paying like 400 bucks a month yeah. in the summer. We've cut it down to like 100. I'm like, yes, yeah. save money and the planet. Woo! Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Let's go ahead and open it up to questions here. Um, who's got mics around here, by the way? Who's holding the mics? We have one mic here. Oh, no, go ahead. You can, uh, are you, you're, oh, that's okay. Oh, you got a hand on my. So let's go, student, then teacher. Go ahead, Jake. Okay. Um, in your, I know in your talk, um, you said it yourself. Uh, like, how much more certain do we have to be? That's the whole topic of all the lectures: is uh, measuring uncertainty. So, how uh, much more? How many more bots? How many much more data do you need to collect before you feel like you can reach your goal, whichever that may be? So telling you that it's going to get warmer, et cetera, that's hard, right? And we've we've kind of done that, and we've had a consistent message. Um, Telling each country how much they're burning on a monthly basis, I need to know that certain enough so that we can verify an agreement. So as a scientist, that excites me because I really want to do, I, I'm not a policymaker. I'm never going to be an inventor of solar panels. I'm, I'm just a scientist. But I'm going to do my part to try and shed light on what's happening so that we can make better decisions. One of the complaints we hear often when we say, let's do the Paris Agreement, why, why get out when we're winning? <laughs> no, really, seriously, why would we leave when we're dropping faster than any country? That just seems silly. I'd rather go to the w WTO and say, hey, all the jerks that aren't lowering their emissions, they should pay more. <laughs> but uh, I know that won't happen. But it would be great if it would. And, and the way to be able, but the only way you could do that is if you could really verify publicly, transparently, with, with robust measurements, who was doing what to the atmosphere. So that it's not a commons, it's a bill. You put this much sewage down the pipe. You owe. And we can't actually make other countries reduce their emissions, but we can do two things. One, we can tell them how bad it is. We can demonstrate how well we're doing. Name and shame. Old-fashioned game. And, and we can sell them the technology to do it themselves. 
I don't, I don't see a downside. So here, yeah. Um, so I actually have a question from a student who just watched and they sent me a question because they wanted to ask you. Um, so they said, even though we have an international political agreement to address the carbon uh, cycle, carbon observing satellites, earth system models and biogeochemical Argo floats, why is it still difficult to get society to care about climate change or even um, worry about addressing it? They're wondering why is it difficult? I actually think it's that old tragedy of the commons when everybody grazes their sheep on the same commons and nobody really counts who's putting the 57 sheep as opposed to two on the commons. That really makes everybody feel like nobody, it's nobody's responsibility because we don't own it. You don't own the atmosphere. You don't own most of the ocean. But I have huge faith that if we could actually verify who is doing the polluting, we could actually change behavior. No one wants to be the mega polluter. Nobody would want to see what those, uh, what that, what impact that would have. And really, all that's missing, in my opinion, and I am just a scientist, is U.S. leadership. I think if we move hard, the rest of the world will follow us. It has, as far as I know, always been thus. And if we treat this as seriously as it should be treated. I think we could make great strides, besides which we'd be lifting our economy at the same time. I mean, nobody wants to lose in that kind of a race, right? Instead of an arms race, it's a better living race. I mean, who, who doesn't want to do that? Uh, but that's, you know, it's mostly based on social science where they say that if, if you get a little insert in your bill that tells you what your neighbors are doing relative to your use, you'll reduce your use even if you're the best in the, in the neighborhood because you're just like, well, <laughs> you know, and I actually were, I wonder if that wouldn't work for all of us. And even if it didn't, shouldn't we be leading anyway? Isn't prosperity and sustainability something we should be going for regardless? I don't care what everybody else does. I want to show them up because I'm that kind of competitive. But at the same time, I really think we should be doing this for our own health and well-being and prosperity anyway. All right, let's go back over there. Can we hand the mic back, please? Excellent. So for those of us who aren't going into the field or career that will have a direct influence on the research of climate change like you, is there anything we can do like in our everyday lives to help at least a little bit? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we do a, a service project in my oceanography class where I just ask them all to make a proposal uh, to what they could do over a semester that would make the world a better place. And I started out with conservation projects, and then I got it broader because, in fact, some of the best impacts were things like uh, reading the Lorax to their church group, um, doing trash pickups with their sorority, doing uh, compost heaps, uh, s recycling drives, homeless food, shelter, water, you know, these things matter. And, and frankly, doing them more sustainably at every level, we can do this. You know, I'm sitting here with a plastic water bottle, but it's not my normal, right? Um, you, and it's not just plastic either. Um, it's also switching fuels when you have an option and everybody says, well, nobody cares about climate change. I'm like, are you kidding? All these people who put solar panels on their roofs. Now they're better off, right? They own a house and they have enough to be able to do that. But they're investing in something that won't pay off for a long time. They're literally putting their money where their values are. We're all doing it. We can walk more, take the bus more. We can carpool more. We can buy a more fuel efficient vehicle. Even if you have to have a truck, you don't have to have the one that's got the worst gas mileage. I mean, there are many ways we can do this. And and every, le this is what's so crazy, as a carbon cycle scientist, I can just tell you, every single molecule you don't emit matters. All of them. I don't care how few there are. One out of every four molecules that comes out of your tailpipe goes in the ocean. Half of everything, all the molecules that go in the ocean, goes in around Antarctica, and I will be measuring it. I'm really serious. If you don't put it in there, it won't keep us warming. And it's going to take everybody, everybody who can reduce to do it for people who can't because you can't leave grandma at the bus stop at 100 degree heat to go to the, to go to the doctor's appointment. It's just not going to work, right? Not everyone will be able to use all the same technology. So we're all just going to have to adapt in our own way. But what's so extraordinary about the U.S. is we've already done it, 15% in 10 years. We could do better if we organized and worked together. 
Amazing. And I bet you didn't even notice that we dropped 15%. Do you feel like your lifestyle has been diminished? No, no. And it's cleaner air and better water and everything. So there's no reason not to do more. I want to alternate between teachers and students. We're going to go to a teacher here, Sandra, and then we'll come over to you, Kat. Okay, grab the mic. Um, so we, we can talk about climate change in the classroom, but I think it's important sometimes to have students to see that, that data and, and be a part of that. And so one of my big things is citizen science projects and how can we get your float data more into the classroom for students we to be looking at? We have an Adopt-a-Float program. One of our floats is coming here to Arizona and is going to be here for about a month and a half and we'll be happy to visit any school. We've got actual people who are paid to do all this. And uh, not only that, but you can go online and be part of the Adopt-a-Float program. And if you send in an original drawing, they will actually uh, uh, print it out and stick it to the float. Wow. Yes. Please come on in. We'd love to have you. No, really, it's so much fun. I mean, we did this, it doesn't, we want you to see, actually, did you know that with our floats right now, you can actually watch in real time the acidification of the ocean. There is a seasonal cycle to it, but it goes like this. The pH of the ocean is dropping and you can see them with an individual float. If you go back and look next year in the same month, it will be lower on that float. It's not a joke. We really are acidifying the ocean in real time. And that acidification is a representation of the increase in carbon that's been taken up by the ocean. So adopt a float. Uh, I, I am mentoring bunches of students with uh, science fair projects using floats. And I mean, it's, it's absolutely fuzzy friendly, come on in kind of science. Great. Before we go to another, I want a follow-up question on what you just said, because there was something in your talk that I found really interesting. You, you kind of passed over it pretty quickly, but it stuck out to me. You, you mentioned that you had a, some recent data that showed that the, the, the uptake of carbon had sort of <laughs> stalled in the Antarctic. And I That's our attention. next big nature paper. Yeah. And <laughs> I couldn't really put up the new graphics because we haven't, it's not accepted yet. So, so can you speak uh, at all to this data or what this is implying? Because I found that to be interesting. Uh, so we're observing a little bit of a leak of that deep rotted water that we thought was permanently parked out in the Pacific safe, not gonna bother us. And in most of the, all the climate model simulations we've done to date, it parks and it doesn't come up and it's okay. But when we put the floats out, we saw a little leak in that Allison Gray's lovely paper saying, here's a little leak. Well, we've done some model experiments where we push the winds and we push the fresh water, which doesn't happen in a normal run because they don't include, remember painted white rocks? Well, we put them in and we run it, ran it forward. And I'm really worried. So the upshot might be, uh, I can't, I, you know, I'll, I'll just say that's what we, we're, we're submitting and it, uh, um, out for review at Nature Geosciences. We'll see how it goes, but yes, there are implications. We are, we are pushing the system hard. We may need to, we may need to drop more than we thought. We may need to start faster and go harder in reducing our emissions than we thought. I really hope that's not the case. Um, I could be wrong. We have a lot more work to do to be sure. It is a future thing, but the little bit of a leak we see now when we push it forward looks like it could become a big leak. And that was related to that, that extra increase in temperature that's that right. we were talking about. Exactly. Okay. Um, Kat, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so it's like kind of just two questions, but they're kind of related. So the first one, um, in your 15-year extended plan, you showed that Australia was going to be, like, drier or hotter. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering about, like, does that mean that the Great Barrier Reef is kind of, like, given up on? Like, you just expect it to all go because it's going to be hot. And then the second part of the question is, Fair Yal Ozel ended her talk saying, like, um, she wants to be wrong, like, in her um, experiments and everything. And I was just wondering if you would want to be wrong that climate change is going to, like, hurt us all in, like, 30 years or so. Um, I'm in a little bit different business because uh, I do a very specifically public interest science. 
right? Meaning I do science with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, they consider my kind of work uh, mission critical, not, so I do, Ferial does amazing things, and it's absolutely true that as scientists, I get very excited when it doesn't work the way I, w I thought it did, because it means I, I didn't, I have not fully understood the whole system, which for my brain is very exciting. But for my mom persona, when I look at my kids and my potential bang babies, I do not want to be wrong. I want to know what we're doing so that we can prevent it. Now, the prevention part here is really simple. CO2 is dangerous to us in the atmosphere. It's a pollutant. We need to mitigate it, and that's just it. And as far as I'm concerned, I need to pass that to the public and to our policymakers, and they need to come up with the best, most cost-effective solutions to fixing that, preferably now. <laughs> On the other hand, so I would, like, I would like them to believe that that science is really solid. I think it is really solid. Um, I think all our predictions have been correct so far. And when we use them as a climate model, as a weather model, you know, we beat the, the Europeans. We, we've been losing to the Europeans on weather forecasts for hurricanes now for almost 10 years. And we beat them with the new model in Hurricane Florence and Lane. And it, it is glorious. So I'm all about skills tests and metrics and doing it better. So I want to be right. But at the same time, when I find something like this leak, on the one hand, I'm excited because I'm like, ooh, here's something that nobody's seen before that is really awesome. And on the other hand, I'm like, oh, dear. You know, I really like my RAV4. I'm looking at not a RAV4. If, we're, if this leak is real, I'm going to have to do something really more serious in our own lives. And the second question was about the Great Barrier Reef, because you painted a, and you spoke three years ago, and you kind of called your shot, and it looks like you were right yep. about the Great Barrier Reef. It seems like that might be a casualty here. Was that, is that? Yes. Yeah. It's, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought we had 10 or 15 more years, maybe 20. And we don't. And part of this is that there was a circulation change in addition to the warming. It didn't just warm. The winds pushed south of, um, towards Antarctica. The big westerlies kind of um, shrunk up towards Antarctica because the warming is basically expanding the tropics like this. And so the westerlies got pushed. And what that did was pulled the hot warm water current along Australia, right along the Great Barrier Reef. And all that hot water is just killing the coral. And, uh, um, and you'll notice that um, the cooler, so we may keep pieces of it. That's what I call refugia, the last best place for a species. So there may be refugia there, but uh, Terry Hughes, who runs the ARC Center for um, uh, Coral Reef Research in Australia, is just in despair because he's, you know, so I'm really excited about what they're doing up at B2, where they're going to do, uh, you know, uh, they're reviving the reef. They're looking at what kinds of reef e ecosystems and infrastructure could actually keep them alive or adapt, et cetera. And uh, I'm also excited because it'll also be a great outreach location where I'm hoping they're going to do like Oculus Rift so you can walk through and see choices. And this this is what it looks like if the temperature is this high. And this is what it looks like if the temperature is this high. And this is what it looks like if we burn this much. And this is what it looks like if you burn this much. And it would not be awesome to help with decision making where you actually visualize what's actually different. Plus, you know, not everybody can afford to go to the Great Barrier Reef. It'd be nice to be able to just visit, you know, gets, you know, yeah. wouldn't it be at home with your, you know, VR and then actually make some decisions. So I'm really excited about how UA is doing citizen science and museum exhibits at Flandro, like with the shark exhibits that's coming and all the rest of it. I love this because, you know, one of, you know, my contract says 40% research, 40% teaching and 20% service. It's meant, I, I work for you. We work for you. And it's so exciting to be at a university. Um, uh, at Princeton, it didn't say anything like that. It was like research. And now it's like, and, and, and I, I think this is really important. We are lucky to live in a place that has a university like UA. And I'm really excited about what they're doing up at B2. I can't wait to see what they come up with. And by the way, B2 is Biosphere 2 for everyone watching. Sorry. There. So yeah, that's okay. Um, all right, let's go here. Let me hand the mic. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we, we have a lot of hands up here, yeah. so go ahead. Um, so you said that there's a leak, uh, potentially, and then you have the... Um, data that you're waiting on to show everybody. They came out with something that had uh, carbon emissions that they could pull from, 
uh, the atmosphere, but you said the atmosphere is just so little compared to the ocean. Is the, are they working on anything to try to draw the carbon dioxide out of the ocean? So uh, the ocean usually ha is is what they call a buffered system. CO2, when it dissolves in, in, in water, forms carbonic acid, which is an H2CO3. Don't panic. I won't do any real crazy chemistry on you. Well, we could but, go there. But no, no. Yes, yes, we could. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does is, is as you change the pH, you basically rip hydrogen ions off, right? Which, which is acid. That's the acidity, the hydrogen ions. And uh, so the trick is, is because it has this kind of multi-phase thing where you can rip the hydrogen ions off, you can act, it's, it's what they call buffered. You can put a ton of carbon in. You can keep, so there's not a limit to how much you can dissolve into the ocean. And we, so as humans, we like it when it dissolves in the ocean because it means less is in the atmosphere trapping heat. But as a coral reef or a uh, you know, coccolithophores that are phytoplankton that make their shells out of calcium carbonate. This is very dangerous. We've already seen mass pteropod death in the Southern Ocean where upwell waters that were very low pH because of the poop and dead bodies basically dissolved them. They died, these sea snails. They just can't live when it's that, that low. So that's the kind of second looming problem is what to do with all the carbon. But um, I don't know, uh, we've got, uh, just today I was reading about Diana Liverman, who's been talking to Klaus Lackner, who's one of the people up at ASU, who's actually working on uh, you know, carbon capture technology. Now, I'm hoping that we go first to conservation, because I think it's cheaper and it works for everyone. Absolutely, everybody will be more prosperous if you don't have to spend as much money on fossil fuels. Everybody. Their fossil fuels aren't good for anything except for plastics <laughs> and, and burning. <laughs> so if we didn't have to use as much, wouldn't that be nice? Because it's actually something you have to, you know. So I'm, uh, I'm really excited about the, um, we aren't worried about drawing it out of the ocean. We're worried about getting it out of the atmosphere. And there are, uh, plants are taking up about a, a quarter of everything we burn and the ocean's taking up about a quarter. Um, and uh, so plant more trees. Um, uh, hopefully Klaus Lackner gets really good and it gets cheap to actually sequester CO2. Uh, but mostly we just don't want to go as high. If we stop burning, we, we can, the, the ocean will continue to take it up because we have a huge overburden and the plants will continue to take it up. But it won't grow, it'll, it'll bend. The curve will start to bend. So hashtag bend that curve. It's what we should all be working on. You saw our curve, the U.S. curve is already bent. You know, we just have to bend it harder. <laughs> and don't let it come back up. You know? But, uh, and then encourage all our colleagues and friends around the world to do the same. I think that what you just said there, a very basic principle in chemistry is so important that many people don't understand, which is the idea that Gas can dissolve in water, but CO2's got that special property where it also reacts with water. Mm -hmm. And in that reaction c produces acid, and that's the problem. So you can dump so much in. That's right. And that's, that's really, I think, a key thing to understand about it. Says the chemist over here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my question is, um, on the graph that you showed with the U.S. and all those other countries, I saw like India was one of the countries on there. And I'm from India. But, uh, and so where my question leads is that for countries like India where we have so much people, but there a lot of them is in poverty and they depend on fossil fuels and things like that to have their economy sustained, what can you say that to them to convince them to make the switch and help the environment? Because right now they're focused on living. I, th I think focusing on living is the right thing, but why not leapfrog? Why put in a whole bunch of coal fire plants if you could put in solar? Why, why spend the money on things that'll just, the brown cloud over India, it's killing people. It's shortening everybody's lives. It's causing miscarriage. It's causing child death. It's causing asthma and disease. It's bad. It actually shortens. It actually postpones the onset of the monsoon by almost two to three weeks now. It's intense and it's foul. They actually stop flights occasionally in and out um, uh, on United because the, the, the cloud is so bad in Delhi. So I would argue that for their health and for their prosperity, not building the infrastructure for this, you know, they don't have a fully functioning infrastructure. They're adding coal fire plants right now. Why not skip that technology and get on to the clean one that'll help them live longer and more prosperously? I mean, why not? You, there's no reason to do, although I did hear that cooking over a, a solar stove is not favored because it doesn't taste right. 
um, compared to the patties that you burn um, a tradition, more traditionally. So I'm hoping we can figure out a way around that. Uh, but, but the brown cloud is killing people. Why not skip? Why not not do that? Um, I understand that they need to develop, but why develop with old crappy technology that kills you? Just a thought. And if we could build better, cheaper, and then sell it to them, that'd be even better. <laughs> Let's go, who's got the mic over here? By the way? Okay, Mike here, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of work our way back around the side and we, okay, go ahead. So he's kind of heading where I was heading, so um, I'll do a tie-in and you can ignore it if it's not your wheelhouse and I have an ocean tangent. Uh, so, you know, William Nordhaus uh, says 3.5 is the, the optimal target economically and I'm, I've been like desperate for some reason to, to, to not believe his- 3.5 degrees warming was the optimal based on qu issues like his, the, the, the benefit to burning. Um, so uh, if that's not your wheelhouse or uh, I was way, I wanted like an inside voice, but the ocean question is about from like over a decade ago, the original climate change workshop. One of the things that stuck with me is where they're talking about the, what are the name of the cycle, the 100,000 year cycle where we get the peak and the drop. And some of that had to do with these ocean currents and the way that they can flip when the temperature gets so high. How high does it have to get? Before for an ocean current to flip, which well, where it where it kicks the Earth into sort of a cooling cycle because of, uh, okay, awesome, good, thank you. <laughs> so then you're gonna ignore both of them. <laughs> no, the first one I actually really love that question. I really think it's a challenge to do the economics of the future. I think that um, <clears throat> our prognostication about how much warming was built in, given our trajectory, was pretty excellent. I would argue that their estimates on what the price of solar panels was going to be was really bad. I, I would make a challenge to our economists to, to look at how well they captured the revolution in solar. I don't think they did at all. I, and they, China just announced that they're going to go to fully no combustion engines on the road all electric by 2030. You, that's 11 years from now. I mean, we're all gonna be buying cheap Chinese cars, you know, because if they can give a billion people transportation with no combustion engines, you better believe we'll be able to buy them for cheap. So I'm, I'm looking at it going, okay, he might be right if he's really good at forecasting technology evolution. I'm betting not. And I absolutely don't wanna see a 3.5 degree C change. That I know what that will look like. Everybody who camps or drives up onto the Mogollon Rim or up onto the Colorado Plateau into Colorado, anybody who has a favorite big pine forest that they like to camp in, those are done at most lower elevations at 3.5 degrees C. They won't be able to handle the heat. My friend Dave Brashears, he's a professor here at the University of Arizona. He's like the professor of dead trees. It's the saddest thing. And, and what he works on is the stress from heat and, uh, and, and drought on trees, not just bark beetles, et cetera, but actually literally suffering. And uh, when you take these drives now, I, I do, we do a road trip every year, um, a big, really big one. And my family and I are, I'm grieving. They, my kids don't know the difference because they can't see it. But I remember what it looked like when it wasn't brown. I remember when the rust wasn't there. I remember when it was deep and green and looked endless. And like there were, I swear there were pixies and bears and weird things I didn't know about that lived in those amazing forests. And, and they're dying. They're suffering. And so we better stop it before 3.5 degrees C if we want to live like we have here in the United States. All right, let's alternate. Let's pass the mic back here, and then we'll come back over there. Thank you. Okay, so um, around, like, two Hold questions. Hold that mic two, up. Two short questions. Um, so how much of the warming do you think is a result of the natural climate cycles? And have you identified any, like, large industry emitters? Like, do certain, are there certain industries that are emitting, emitting much more than others? Because uh, I know you mentioned country, like, some countries are emit, emitting much more than others, but... Industry-wise. Any industry that uses coal yeah. emits much more than any other. And that's just straight up. And the reason is that you get less energy per unit of carbon. Yeah. So if you're burning coal as your main fuel source, you are definitely dirtier. And I always like to ask, it's another sort of chemistry, geochemistry question. I always ask my students, I'm like, so which do you think lasts longer? N radioactive waste from a nuclear power plant or mercury that blows out of the emissions downwind of a coal-fired plant. 
which do you think it lasts longer? You don't have to tell me. Nuclear waste decays. Mercury is an element. It never decays. It's just plain toxic to you forever. It makes bonds, uh, we could go into the chemistry. It's very bad. Um, we're poisoning ourselves. It's a bad idea. We really shouldn't be using coal at all anymore. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say it because it's bad for us. The particulate emissions are bad. The mercury is bad. Do you know if you're pregnant, you're not supposed to eat the fish in 48 states now? You know which 48 states? The 48 states that aren't Alaska and Hawaii because they don't have coal-fired plants upwind. Seriously. It's very serious. We shouldn't be burning coal. It's bad for the environment. It's terrible for our global warming. And so if you know an industry that's doing that, then uh, um, <laughs> I would love us to be the first state that wasn't burning coal. And the sad thing is I, I would fair to guess that these lights are being powered by burning coal. In Eastern nope. Arizona. No? Nope. It's Palo Verde. 40% well, of our electricity comes from nuclear. Woohoo! Oh, well, that's good. I stand corrected. That's yes, good. and then you add on our solar and our hydro and our wind, and we're actually just close on electricity. Not so much for pale pipes, obviously. Yeah. For transportation, we still have an issue. But when it comes to electricity, we could be one of the first states. I don't, I don't know why we don't like make a push for it, because we could be one of the first states that hangs out of, hangs out of shingle to Google and says, come live in one of the be most beautiful, most clean, most gorgeous states and have permanent, ongoing green power forever. Yeah. Mm. No brownouts, we're not California. No, you know, horrible coal, we're not Tennessee. You know, come here, you know? And everybody's like, so how do you cool those, you know, a nuclear power plant? That must be dangerous. I'm like, no. And you know, then the reason I say no is just, they're like, well, what do you cool it with? You know, because they've had all this trouble in all these other places. I'm like, you know, it's the toilet water from Phoenix. <laughs> and somebody's like, well, what if you run out of water from the toilets? I'm like, well, then the zombie apocalypse has occurred yeah. and there are no people in Phoenix. Because if there are people, there are toilets. And if there are toilets, you can cool the nuclear power plant. <laughs> All right, let's go here and we'll have I was going to switch gears a little bit. I was looking around on the SOCOM website and saw the adoptive float and uh, a few of the other things out there. Are there going to be lessons for teachers to be able to use with their students to take that data and actually do some manipulation yes, and look at it? We do have some classroom. We have, uh, we have some uh, lesson plans. We also have short videos and everything, too, that do you know, do some of it for you if you, you know, in short snips. And uh, I'm not sure if they, if they're not available, they should be because uh, we have a, we have a whole kind of team that worked on this and I worked on it too, because I, I love teaching oceanography and oceanography from floats is my, my gig. And so how, how do you suggest we engage students in m more of um computer modeling or trying to look at math and make more sense of math, make it real? You know, we have uh, um, uh, the Columbia, the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and NASA have collaborated to make a desktop climate model. It's not as good as my fabulous one, but it's pretty good. And you can actually play with the scenarios in it. You know, literally, you can play with it. You can say, well, what happens if we reduce our emissions? What happens if India reduces its emissions? What happens if the U.S. keeps burning and China reduces its emissions? You can play with the economic and the actual physical climate uh, variables, and it's quite fun. I mean, okay, I'm a total nerd, but, but it's like a game, it's, um, and it's your future. I hand the bike back to Jerry, yeah. So I was wondering if, as an oceanographer, you've studied uh, like different pollutants in the ocean other than emissions, like plastics, and if you have any ideas about like the um, Great Pacific uh, garbage patch and if like how big of a threat you think that is, especially in comparison to the warming of the ocean, and if you think it's possible for us to like clean that up, and if you like just how like what are your thoughts on that? So uh, I'm less worried about garbage because it decays. Um, CO2 we emit now will not be removed from the system in the next thousand years. So that's why we worry about it. Everybody says, what about methane? And I've said, you know the lifetime of methane in the atmosphere is 10 years. So it's true, if we're emitting some methane now, that's bad. But if we stopped emitting it, in 10 years, the problem's gone. 
right? Whereas CO2, it's a thousand years. It's a long time. It doesn't decay. It doesn't go away. It has to actually be redistributed into one of the other reservoirs. So I don't worry about plastics because sun in particular um, breaks down plastic. It's a hydrocarbon, et cetera. And you, sun is one of the, so eventually they will just turn into tiny little pellets and then eventually they will literally be broken down into their uh, t- like ligands and little tiny things. And, uh, they're, it's bad, and we can't do a lot about it. And the reason is that there are seven countries in East Asia that are pollu- putting in about 85% of the plastic. The U.S. is 0.4% of all the plastic that ends up in the ocean. If we reduce our 0.4%, which we should do, it's a nothing burger. It did not help. I mean, it really isn't even in the noise of how much plastic is there is. We need those countries that don't have proper sewage and waste stations. They don't have an environmental protection agency. They don't have a municipal dump. They don't have garbage collection. They don't have, they don't have a process for dealing with their own waste. Um, this is where I think our, our water managers and our sewer managers that do outreach to other countries, et cetera, that do conferences and invite people and show other folks how to do it, who train people, people who have <laughs> universities like ours that have training programs, et cetera, internships. We need to train more people. We need to transfer what we know about how to manage our waste to other places because, in fact, we save money that way. You know, it's not just a rich thing. It's a how do you manage it thing. And a lot of that, I think, is uh, the fact that we have eight countries in East Asia doing almost all of the Pacific garbage patch damage means it's going to be that that's different from the carbon problem, isn't it? Where we're the second or third biggest emitter, right? Where if we change our behavior, we lead the world, we make a definite dent in everything by changing our behavior but our 0.5 percent or less is not going to help us on the plastic problem and we're really talking about something really inside somebody's national borders the waste that's coming down the river you get one good storm and out she comes Mm. so uh interesting it is certainly a problem but you're dealing with this sort of seems a more immediate problem in some sense at least from your perspective i love that we're working on these other things and i think they're important because um you know, plastic's gross and it chokes a lot of marine life, and I would like to enjoy it too. But at the same time, uh, I, I have this one: every molecule, every time we put carbon in the atmosphere, every single one, it's going to take forever, our forever, our lives. It will still be there. Yeah. Okay. Let's um, let's pass some uh, pass some mic back over there to Annie. Go ahead, Annie. So you mentioned how few people are doing this type of research currently. How do you think you can, we can change that and get more people involved? Or do you think we're so close to certainty that it's not even that necessary anymore? Um, I think for um, climate prediction, we're pretty close. But, of course, we just got a climate model that works on a weather model and started beating ECMWF. So I'm like, yeah, we need more people. We need more Americans doing this kind of work. The trick is, um, and of course, like all the meteorologists that used to be trained on statistics, we need them trained on dynamical models now. Yeah. So 6,000 oceanographers, 60,000 meteorologists, 600,000 geologists. That's the way earth sciences goes. Every university Mm -hmm. has an earth science, as a geology department. Almost none of, uh, some of them have atmospheric sciences department. None of them have oceanography departments. They're, okay, some do. You see Santa Barbara, you see Santa Cruz, you know, along the coast. They have lovely oceanography departments. But people in Oklahoma and Kansas and Montana need to know about the ocean just like somebody in Santa Barbara. That's not a joke. And it's all about not just our weather, but actually our climate. And I, yes, I would like to see more people go into the field, but I want to make sure. And just by the way, I have a hard time keeping my grad students in the field, not because they can't get jobs. I have a, one of my students, Juan Laura, just started as an assistant professor at Yale. I have another one that just got tenured at the Univad of Reno. You know, we, they go everywhere. They do amazing things, but they also go off to hedge funds and to, uh, you know, Amazon Web Services and to ExxonMobil because people who know big data and big earth systems like from the ocean perspective are unique and valuable there isn't there are you know who hires meteorologists walmart 
because supply chains are short now and they need to know when we're buying what to buy and how, how long it's going to take to get something there and what the risks are. The Kirkuk, you know, when they tried to move this massive drilling platform north in the Arctic and they hit a big storm, billion dollars down the toilet. These are, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think why one wouldn't need to know this. I think we need a lot more. I would love to be what I want to do here at the University of Arizona is set up, and they've already got a hydrometeorology program over in hydrology and atmospheric sciences. I'm now joint with them. I'm so excited. And we're working on trying to get things like a cooperative institute with NOAA so that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration so we can train graduate students to go straight to work for them. They're going to have this massive graying workforce that's going to retire probably faster now that they missed a couple paychecks. You know, why work for free, you know, when you can retire? And we're going to need to replace them. Why not our bright students from here in Arizona and from our university? We could be the ones that hit that line, that help hold it, that push it forward. I, I can't wait. I'm very excited about this. You know, it's interesting you mention that because even in many theoretical sciences, that like the insurance actuaries, people go <laughs> and become insurance actuaries because they, they work in I, Esri, the mapping company. I mean, I could just like D.E. Shaw, McKinsey Consulting Company. I could start naming the places that my students go and it's like, I mean, yes, they all make more than me. <laughs> but, but, but really, it's just about... Um, using math to improve our world, to, to calculate the odds of what's next, to do the careful, you know, and everybody who's worried about your math skills, maybe you didn't do well in undergrad or you had a hard time in high school or something. Oh, for crying in the beer, Einstein flunked twice. I mean, it, you don't need an A, you just need to get it, right? A B will do. I'm serious. A C is fine. Just don't stop. Really, I mean it. For all of you who think that only straight-A people in math can do this work, bull. That's just bull hucky. Seriously, come on in. I mean, it helps if you're good at it. It helps if it comes naturally, et cetera. And if you really hate it, you shouldn't do it. But on the other hand, sometimes it just takes a little more elbow grease. A little more elbow grease. Yeah. And, and, and the world opens up. A couple more questions. Let's go, let's work a whack over here. Why don't you go to Sophia and then back to Jack. Do you have the mic? Yeah, okay, go ahead. So um, I know there's been some pretty substantial changes to the EPA in the last few years, and I'm wondering how this has impacted your research and the kind of research that you do. Um, we're going to get past this. So you have to understand, my, I worked at um, Princeton and, and, and heavily with the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory before I came here. So my email got, was put into the congressional record for the first time in 2002. And the reason was my, uh, the, the Office of Political Affairs was sitting on one of my papers because it was a global warming paper back under a previous administration. So these things happen. I guess what I'm trying to say, and this is what I want to say to all my no young NOAA colleagues, these things happen, all my young EPA colleagues, these things happen. But this, the Clean Air and Water Act are still the law of the land. That is what governs us. The fact that the EPA goes off their nut and doesn't, okay, not their fault, but doesn't, doesn't have the means to actually enforce the law doesn't mean it's not the law, right? If I were a big company, I would be very careful because the next time we do have the means to enforce it, you're still liable. Sorry, but you are. Doesn't matter that the EPA didn't catch you that year, they'll catch you next year. So as far as I'm concerned, the EPA is fine because the law has not changed. The law is the law. These are regulated under the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, which were passed in the 70s. They are, and they have done amazing things for our environment. I went to visit in China and have been several times now because they're building this amazing ocean university in Qingdao. And they want 5,000 oceanographers to be working there. When I first went, their <laughs> campus was literally empty. There were like eight oceanographers working there. I'm really not kidding. And the trees were being propped up by sticks because they were so new. They'd been planted so quickly that their trunks weren't strong enough to hold them up yet. I mean, they were like that. And so I keep coming back every year. And the next year, there were, there were 30. And after that, 100. And after that, 200. 
Do you know what I mean? They're growing really fast. But I went there and they said, so come, come spend some time, you know, take your sabbatical year and spend a year with us. And you can bring your family. We'll put you up in this beautiful apartment and all the rest of it. But I had a headache from the air pollution and I couldn't drink anything that wasn't in a plastic bottle. Who wants to live where you can't breathe the air and you can't drink the water? So I have faith that we will put the teeth back in our EPA and that not everybody will retire and that we will get things back on track because the law has not changed. Yeah, I'm like back to Jack. And we'll I'm sorry, that sounds silly, but uh, I have faith. <laughs> we'll go to Jack and then we're gonna do one more question after that, go ahead. So um, when we go back to school tomorrow and face a bunch of 14, 15, 16 year olds, um, where do you see, where do you see, and for these guys here, where do you, what are the careers that are going to solve this problem? Do we need another 6,000 oceanographers or, I mean, Oh, see, that's the, the thing is I, I can barely keep my own oceanographers because we need urban planners. We need traffic specialists. We need uh, remediation specialists. We need environmental scientists who do soil, air, water measurements. We need, we don't just need scientists. We also need people who do the math, who actually calculate what the risks are. What happens if I change the light sequence? Can I cut the amount of idle time at the lights by X? You could save an insane amount of money by optimizing the lights on Oracle. I'm <laughs> <No>, just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. The more time you spend idling, the more, more fossil fuels are wasted straight up. I mean, imagine you have to think bigger. What I'm saying is what I think everybody should do is make sure that they, they can read and write and do their basic math. Everyone should be able to do this, that everybody should spend a little time hacking around on their computers, that, 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 that computers are basically our auxiliary brains and no one, and I know none of the young ones are afraid of them. My gosh, my kids just like, they're nuts. I mean, I have to drag them off their screens. Here, read a book. They're like, I can read online. I'm like, you won't. <laughs> Here's the book. <laughs> but, but, but really, what you're doing as educators, this is the fundamental. It's the most important because they can take what you'd give them and turn it into anything. Their careers will not be the same. I started out making measurements by hand right? I was a wet chemist, a bench chemist. I made spectrophotometric pH measurements one by one by one. Now I use supercomputers and robot floats and satellites. Do you know what I mean? And, and who knows what the next technology will be, but I'll be there. I'll be adapting. And, and really, what did I have to start with? Well, okay, I came from a little tiny, you know, up, little tiny town in Alaska, which, and then when I got to high school, they didn't have any calculus literally no calculus, no chemistry, no physics. They had one biology class and algebra. So after I finished my freshman year, I begged my parents if I, if I could get a scholarship, could I go to boarding school? Because I wanted to do more science. In Tucson, it's a science city. You, you've got University High, you've got, you've got magnet programs, you can, you, you've got an observatory on the high school. It's crazy how much amazing opportunity there is right here in Tucson to do fantastic science. Your science fair, SARSF and all the rest of it that you do right here is stunning. I mean, I can't believe how competitive it is. I, I'm thrilled to raise my children right here in Tucson. It's the best place. I can, and bu yes, both my kids are in TUSD public school. <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't think you need to change what you're teaching them. I think you guys are already doing a great job. My, my, I love what my kids are learning. I'm thrilled how quick they're moving right along. I, I would like to make sure there's more opportunity for more of the district so that not, because I don't think all the schools have great talented science and math teachers, but I'm stunned at how well um, uh, my own kids are coming along. And I, I just have so much hope for what happens next. I want to ask the last question here. Um, you know, you've had a lot of experience with going to Washington and dealing with climate, you know, going to Paris, that sort of thing. And so you've had a frontline experience of the pushback against, or people pushing back against the message that you spoke about tonight. Could, I mean, could you give us a sense of, in your opinion, what, what's the core root of that pushback? I Where's don't know, and I can't tell you, uh, because in fact, I've done all of that, and I have literally never been heckled. I've been working in climate change forever. 
I was the distinguished lecturer for the American Association of Petroleum Geologists in 2011. They sent me to the oil patch from Saskatoon to Houston, from St. John's Bay to Chevron headquarters. I went and gave talks on global warming and climate science and oceanography all over the country and Canada. And I didn't get heckled once. They were kind. They were interested. They asked me questions. It was a lot of fun. And they were, they were smart and educated. And, and they care about what happens next. They also are really incredibly practical about, well, how are we going to get to market? What are we going to do for energy? If you want to switch it so badly, tell us how we should do it. Well, I don't know. You guys are the experts. Figure it out. Um, no, no, seriously. But, but I'm not an expert in energy policy. I'm an expert in oceanography. On the other hand, the people I have talked to are just amazing. I think we can do this. I think we can do better. I'm disappointed in our politicians. I feel like they don't take, they should get educated. This is serious. Um, I know that the National, Academy, <laughs> the National Academy of Science in the United States has a charter signed by Abraham Lincoln to provide advice on science and technology policy to Congress. That's their job. They're, and let me tell you, there are a couple of little problems with that. One, it's a private club that elects its own members. Two, they're older than Moses. So when I look at them, I'm going, yeah, of course you don't have any climate scientists. It's a relatively young field. I mean, really, first climate prediction was in 1950, whatever, right? We're not that old wow. a field. So I understand why we got a little, little log jam here, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something just awful here. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking out at all these dinosaurs. And I'm thinking I'm the meteorite. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where we're going to end this. I want to thank you, Joellen, uh, Russell, uh, for taking time. I'm John Pollard. This is episode three. We'll be back in two weeks with episode four and the, the next lecture series, who I believe is... Um, Donato Vercelli. Donato Vercelli. We're talking about the microbiome. It's going to be amazing. Yay! All right. Thank you again. Thank you for coming. <laughs>